Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today I want to introduce you to a new video format called All Them Questions, where I basically go back and take a video that I released in the past, and I answer all the questions present at this moment on the channel, so that you may have a very concise and to the point answer to the most pressing questions. And because it's a cooking channel, I think it's very important for you to have as of an in-depth um, understanding of what's happening because you are eating this food, you are feeding this food to your friends and family, and that ranks really high on my importance level. Now, the main point of making these videos is because I go through all of your questions and I do my absolute best to answer them. And I found myself going through a lot of questions, a lot of answers, both from myself and from other participants in the chat, and it gets very confusing. So, uh, for example, if you really need a, a quick answer for something that is pressing because you're doing a meat project or you're doing a dish or you're preparing dinner whatever the reason may be and you have to scroll and open a uh, uh, 100 to 20 even 10 questions that have 10 answers themselves it can get pretty confusing and frustrating so from my own experience with this process of answering the comments and uh, checking what other people have commented and their opinion I'm bringing this format in order for you to maybe even listen to it like a podcast. Uh, it's going to be timestamped, so your question will be answered or somebody's question that is related to your need will be answered and you can just click on the timestamp and, and get your answer basically in seconds instead of going through the long and hard and arduous process of diving through. I mean, some videos have 600,000 questions or answers like those videos i don't even know how to <laughs> tackle i don't even know how to approach because i don't know how i can answer uh, even a thousand questions in one of these videos so we'll see that time will tell and i'm sure i'm going to find a, a solution but because i'm not a, a, a sadist uh, i didn't choose a video with a, an insane amount of questions to break the ice basically but i chose the i have my laptop here on the side with all the questions i chose the how to make uh, salt pork in two weeks video something that a lot of you are interested in a lot of you have questions about it and i said what better way to start this new playlist this new video format than with something that uh, you know it's a pressing matter and i am recording this video at the beginning of august um, soon as september comes so in a month from now uh, if you want to prepare temperatures are going to drop and that's like the beginning of the optimal season to cure meats to prepare for winter and all of that good stuff which is from this perspective my favorite season even though i love i love summer but my stomach loves autumn so grab yourself a drink a pair of headphones if you're listening to this uh, while you work or something like that just autopilot the hell out of it and let's begin okay so the first question comes from peter pan and uh, the question is what is the correct temperature for hanging the meat to dry for those of you who haven't seen the video yet i'll put it here so maybe have a look so you know what i'm talking about but as part of the curing process and making of that salt pork recipe the meat had to hang and dry for a period of time and the optimal temperature for curing any meats, any meats, regardless if it's bird or beef or pork, is between 5 and 12 Celsius. And in Fahrenheit, I have it here, uh, 5 Celsius is 41 Fahrenheit and 12 Celsius is 53.6 Fahrenheit. So between 41 and 53 Fahrenheit, if you're using that system, that's the optimal temperature to cure meat, to hang it, to store it, to... Um, you know to keep it safe away from bacteria from molds from anything and if you think about it that's quite a strict temperature range and how can you achieve it uh, especially if you're doing a diy salt pork recipe at home or what i would call it it's a traditional salt pork because you know my grandparents and their parents they didn't have fridges they didn't have temperature probes like this you know to i got props what do you think look at me i have props they didn't have all of this technology to uh, make sure that, you know, it doesn't go a degree above that uh, until all the alarms and bells and whistles uh, come off and you have to go and uh, readjust it. What they did and what I usually do as well is I use the seasons in my advantage. That's why between 
late September when the temperatures drop and you get those cool, um, you know, foggy mornings and up until late November, beginning of December, the temperature uh, maintains itself, at least where I live, which is North Europe, uh, maintains itself in between that, uh, let's say, golden ratio of temperatures. Alternatively, what you can do is to use fridge if you have it. Wow, my dog is doing some weird stuff. Shadow. Sorry about that. But yeah, you can use a fridge if you have some spare space. And uh, one of the videos that's, you know, doing the best on the channel has been done in a fridge. And this is because it was the beginning of the pandemic. I didn't have options. I didn't have a balcony. I didn't have any other methods. So I did it in the fridge. But that takes space. Uh, cleaning, you know, it, it is... It's a desperate solution for something that can be done um, out in the open space if you have the temperature. Now you're going to say, well, what if I don't have a garden or an outdoor space? What if... Um, my neighbors are gonna, I don't know, call the cops on me because I'm hanging meat uh, out in the view and that's considered whatever taboo, which I had issues here as well. We are being attacked by diving birds. I know, I know. Go, go in and hunt some birds. Go, I, I give you my blessing. I know, I know. Go and hunt some birds and let me do my stuff. Shadow, <laughs> go and hunt some birds. I know. Yeah, such a good baby. Yes. Come here. Oh my God. Oh my God. Such a good baby. Such a good hunter. But now go and hunt. So yeah, um, I'm doing this at the garden. So, you know, you, you're going to have to take it as it is with all the live, live action, live animals, live nature. Where was I? So yeah, what happens if you don't have an outdoor space? What happens if you don't have sp space in the fridge? What happens if you don't have a walk-in fridge? You're not a business, you all of that stuff. Well, something that uh, I've been doing, but I didn't really make it public, is that sometimes you can just use a dehydrator. Um, they're cheap, they're affordable they're long lasting they're very simple in the parts that they use so they're not going to break too often and uh, it's an investment that you make once and i don't think you're going to be curing meat in the dehydrator non-stop in, in order to use it up and i don't know make it break so that's what i do sometimes when uh, all the odds are against me and i cannot do the projects that i want to feed my family or to quote a famous politician to put food on my family when i cannot do any of the above mentioned i use a dehydrator i still uh, uh, preserve it in salt i still keep it in salt as in the video and then instead of hanging it out for uh, whatever amount of days in the temperature i just put it in the dehydrator for depending on the recipe depending on the product that i'm making uh, and it works I mean, the whole point of hanging it to dry is to lose moisture to dehydrate to dry. So a dehydrator does exactly that, but quicker. And some of you are going to say, well, yeah, but the dehydrator has temperature settings. And if you put it too high to finish quicker, then it's going to cook it. So it's going to be cooked. It's not going to be a cured raw meat product. It's not. It's going to become something else. Well, true, but the knob can be dim down as well so you don't have to put it on the highest temperature yes you will use a bit of electricity but that's the difference between making these meat projects or not or buying them from the shop and again i don't want to demonize buying stuff from the shop but i've worked in that industry in that corner of, of business and i wouldn't advise it uh, maybe as time passes, I'm going to tell you some secrets behind closed doors, but we'll see how this goes. This is a pilot. And if this goes well, then uh, we can make more videos and I can talk more about stuff. Until then, uh, I think that kind of answers the questions from Peter Pan. Let's go to the next question or we're going to be here for a while. Question from Starwater. And the question is, what chemicals are in pink Himalayan sea salt? Uh, I, I don't know if 
pink Himalayan salt is a sea salt. I don't know, honestly. I'm not trying to condemn or to judge anything. But this question comes because in the video I said uh, I am a strong supporter of just rock salt, mine salt, you know, uh, and sea salt. But honestly, sea salt is quite expensive. It is a huge uh, improvement. Uh, it is a high quality product, but uh, where I am at and where I've been before, sea salt is very expensive. That's why I use rock salt, which is the most basic salt out there. I buy it in bags of 25 kilos. It's affordable and I make all of my meat projects uh, based on, on rock salt and it never falters and, and it never misses. And in that in the video, I mentioned that, you know, uh, using pink Himalayan salt is not a good option just because it's expensive. Um, I think the person confused it with um, with pink salt, you know, the number two cure, the, the pink cure salt. Um, I don't know. I'm assuming that. But the point is, one, pink, pink Himalayan salt is very expensive. Number two, most of the pink Himalayan salt that you find on the market is just painted uh, rock salt that they sell at a premium. Because, <laughs> um, you know, we humans know how to make buck here and there. And uh, third, the, the more recent studies show that Pink Himalayan salt is not as healthy as it was marketed to be a while back when it, it was a novelty. Um, mainly because uh, it has a lot of trace minerals um, that are beneficial for us. That's what makes it good and it, it was the whole reason why it was hyped and marketed as the next savior thing on the planet. But the trace minerals in pink Himalayan salt are below the limit that we would benefit from them. So in order to get the benefits from those trace minerals, you would have to eat a lot of salt, which then that leads to other problems like hypertension and, and all of that stuff. I'm not a doctor, but you know, you read stuff here and there. That's one thing with pink Himalayan salt. Second of all, by the same studies, they proved that uh, apart from the trace minerals being below the limit that we need, there's also other nasty stuff uh, in it like lead, uh, aluminium, mercury, and I'm sorry, but you don't need to know much to understand that aluminium is the worst thing that you can do for your brain cells, for your neurons. That's why, uh, you know, all of those uh, arm armpit sticks things that uh, people use for um, anti-sweating, they're full of aluminium. And that's why me and my family stopped using them like seven years ago and we make our own uh, deodorant that's aluminium free. Uh, so the surest way to lose a lot of neurons is to ingest aluminium. Second of all, lead, I don't need to go into that, right? And third, mercury, well, that's a... <laughs> that's... I'll stop. You are smart. You can do just a quick research uh, on these three elements and um, I'm not going to go into a half an hour rant about this. But this is what scientists have discovered and this is why I don't think pink Himalayan salt is a optimal solution for curing meats. The price and all the, the gunk that is there and all the benefits that are not up to the levels that we actually need them to become beneficial. I'll move on. Next question. Okay, next question comes from a person called Free Range. And the question is, so do you cook it before you eat it? Or can you just eat it like that raw? Uh, the question is, I use it in both ways. If I make a dish like a salt pork stew or a soup or something where the meat is the condiment is, is is the ingredient not the the main star of the attraction um, i cook it if i'm making a sandwich or if i'm making a charcuterie board or uh, i just want uh, <laughs> something to chew on something high in protein because i'm really hungry and i am jittery and i had too much coffee like i usually do and i just need that uh, huge spike of protein to calm me down and to get my system back in check i just grab a cube of salt pork and i chew on it so i eat it raw as well um, 
both ways cooked and raw i eat it after i uh, kept it in water for at least three hours the thing is if you don't soak it like i've mentioned in this uh, easy salt pork recipe that i've given you guys here uh, the amount of salt present in this piece of meat is going to make it inedible. The salt is there to preserve it, the salt is there to cure it, the salt is there to keep this meat viable as long as possible. That's why we need to soak it for at least three hours in cold water. And usually I change the water like after every hour. Otherwise the salinity that's going to be present in that water very quickly is just going to continue to keep that piece of meat in salt. So another good advice would be change the water every hour. And then, you know, cut it in half and at the core, whatever piece of meat you have, try a small slice and see uh, the salinity level. Because look, some days... I eat a bucket of salt. Some days uh, I cannot stand salt and I have a very tiny amount. It depends on the electrolytes and depends on how much physical work I've done. It depends on how hot uh, is outside. So uh, we all go through these spikes and lows uh, in salt intake based on what the, the body needs. Water and salt is what makes the electric current in our body that moves every muscle that you know connects every brain cell work makes our body work that's where the word electrolytes comes from is yeah it's magnesium and all of that stuff but it's basically salt and water so every morning when i wake up i basically have a tiny bit of uh, apple cider vinegar that i make myself uh, i have a video have a have a look here and uh, then i have a tiny bit of uh, rock salt um with water and that's it and that starts my system you know that makes me able to get out of bed to not be groggy to not be sleepy and start my day in the most energy filled way possible because all my systems are running all my cylinders are pumping um and that's a secret you know that's that's a trick that a lot of uh, people use and it's i i rarely find any information about out there so you're welcome while we're on this question and i mentioned charcuterie boards in the video i i say that this is not a charcuterie product meaning it's not something fancy that you put on a on a meat board a picnic table whatever and this is because of the salinity level uh, but i adore this kind of meat this is like 99 percent of how i eat meat these days and it's been like this for years like don't get me wrong i like a steak from time to time I like a barbecue chicken thigh. I, I like these things, but fresh meat just doesn't taste good to me. I don't know if it's because I'm getting old and my taste buds are changing. You know, I used to not enjoy stinky old farty cheese uh, a while ago, like Stilton and Cambozola and Gorgonzola and all of those uh, really heavy duty stinky cheeses. Cheeses? Cheese? Cheeses. Uh, but <laughs> as I'm getting older and my hair is turning gray, I begin to like them. And uh, things that I used to enjoy, they don't hit the mark anymore, you know? So I'm not making any um, claim that cured meat is the best way or the best method to eat meat. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that for my palate, for the stage of life that I'm in now, Cured meat is the way that I enjoy eating meat the most. And fresh meat is like, hey, if I go to a family party or a barbecue or something like that or a birthday and they have fresh grilled cooked meat, I'll eat it. I'm, I'm not going to be that asshole. But um, once a week, actually, me and my wife, we have a lunch or a dinner where it's basically a charcuterie board with cheese, with meat, with fruits and vegetables. And the, the main star of that meat board, of that charcuterie board, are the meats that I'm making. And sometimes the salt pork has, a, has an appearance and um, I love it. I love it. But soak. It, it needs to be soaked. Okay, well, let's move on. <laughs> okay, the, the next question, and I love this name, is from somebody called Hillbilly Goat Roper. Can you imagine having actually having this name and not being a, a nickname or like an internet uh, avatar? I think I'm going to call my, my, my kid this. Hillbilly Goat Roper. Oh, God, I wish I was that.
Okay, the question is, how do you store it after it's dry enough without a freezer? Um, okay, M most of the times when I do these projects, I uh, give as a storage method, vacuum seal it or just putting it in a bag and in the freezer because a freezer is a really good place to store finished products. Why? Because it doesn't continue to dry. It doesn't uh, rehumidify if, if that's the case. But if you don't have a freezer, um, a very good place is uh, a cold attic of the house. Like my grandparents, they didn't have even a fridge. Uh, I'm not even going to mention a freezer. Um, so they, they were uh, original peasants. Uh, you know, they lived off the land and uh, later in their life they, they had to get jobs because, you know, that's that's how life is. But um, the way they stored the meat, okay, let's, let's start from the beginning. They raised one or two hogs throughout the summer with food scraps and weeds and all of that stuff, you know, in the most region way possible, which was the norm. We call it regenerative agriculture now, but, you know, that's how people lived for thousands of years. Then around Christmas time on the 20th of, of uh, December or earlier, but that was the traditional sacrificing day, they would, you know, process the, the, the pigs and every single bit of that animal was used. Even the bones, the bones were not um, thrown away or given to the dog. The bones were, boy, um, sorry, the bones were smoked uh, uh, and when they butchered the hog they left a tiny 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 bit of meat on it but all the bones were smoked and they were kept and then in the dead of winter or springtime when there was nothing else they would take one or two of those bones and they would make a huge pot of soup where again the bones and the meat on it was just an ingredient to flavor things and potatoes carrots and all those root vegetables that would store well over winter was the the, the bulk of it but what i'm trying to get at is that the main storage place for for two hogs and all the processed products that they would make from it you know smoked meats lard fat uh, ribs sausage everything would be held in an attic on hooks like i don't have any see i'm, I'm not that good with props next time i need to have hooks and everything else but they were hanging in the attic which wasn't insulated because there was nobody living there it was a storage space but that attic was cold enough because outside there was, you know, it was winter, dead of winter or early spring. So it was cold enough again between those temperatures, 5 and 12 Celsius, 41 to 53 Fahrenheit. And the meat kept uh, a tiny bit of smoke would trickle from the chimney. So they would constantly get a tiny bit of smoking uh, to, you know, deter anything that would have uh, the vague idea of going and attaching to it, like, I don't know, uh, uh, bacteria or uh, spoilage mold or slime mold or something like that. And that was one method. Another method to keep it, um, so we have freezer, we have an attic. Uh, then a pantry. A pantry, if you have a pantry, uh, you can store it in a pantry uh, just uh, a piece of advice here try to keep it somewhere stored on the lower parts of the pantry and not touching surfaces so again it, it would be good if you can hang it so it stays hanged because once it touches things then there's a possibility of it going bad and i'm saying on the lower part of the pantry because temperature in the house rises so the the top parts of any room are going to be the warmest parts the, the lower parts are going to be the coldest parts. So if you want to keep in uh, in the good segment of the temperature, then just use the lower parts of your pantry. And I think the last place that I would mention is uh, a root cellar. If you have a root cellar or a cold box, I've seen people building their own DIY cold boxes where it literally acts like a, like a fridge, like a refrigerator, then that would be a good... Uh, addition as well or a, a good method of doing this as well okay next question comes from m lips comb probably can this uh, can this process be used on meat with bone or should it be exclusively done on meat without bones ideally 
this method is used for boneless meat, like lean meat. But this guide to preserving meat um, has a salinity that's so high that preserving meat with bones wouldn't be an issue. I remember my grandparents uh, curing in the same method and preserving in the same method uh, ribs. Like again, when I mentioned that they would process one or two hogs a year, uh, the whole rib sides uh, they wouldn't do any barbecues and stuff like that be because it wasn't traditional. We, we actually use ribs primarily to make soups, sour soups, instead of just cooking them on the grill. That's some very alien process and concept to us. Because, you know, you extract all the goodness from the bones at the same time as you have that intercostal uh, tiny amounts of meat that are just the, the cherry on the cake. Honestly, when you have one of those soups, oh wow. Um, um, I have a shower in my mouth, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop. But, um, so yes, this process can be used for meat with bone as well, uh, just because the amount of time that it spends covered in salt uh, helps everything. So yes, the answer is yes, full speed ahead. Next question. Will this process be the same for beef or any other meats besides pork? And the second question, does this meat need to be stored in the fridge or can it stay on the counter indefinitely? Good, two part question. Uh, first part of the question, if this process can be used for any other meats apart from pork. Definitely it can be used for beef. Beef can be cured in the same way or, or preserved in the same way. This salt curing meat at home method uh, it's quite simple and ancient if you think about it, but I will not advise you to use it for bird meat because the thing with bird meat is that it has to be cooked. It has to be cooked above 75 Celsius in order to um, eliminate any risk of salmonella. And salmonella is just one thing, but it's the one that's been used uh, and publicized the most out there. So I'll use it as well. So I don't go again on a half an hour rant or, or, or description about all the other things that are in bird meat. And the main reason why this humongous CAFOs and huge processing plants, they literally uh, bathe the, the, the raw chicken after they sacrifice them in chlorine water. I mean, that needs to, you know, put some gears into motion. Let me top up my, yeah, coffee, coffee. Sweet, sweet juice of morning and afternoon. I love coffee. I know this is not a video about coffee. And I do stop drinking coffee at uh, 12. So I don't drink coffee after 12 because it messes up with my sleep, which is a big problem. But until 12, waterfalls of coffee waterfalls of coffee in my belly back to the question i see over overly caffeinated mike um where was i yes bird meat chlorine water so i will not advise anybody to cure to cure uh, bird meat regardless if it's chicken turkey whatever with salt bird meat needs to be cured if you do want to uh cure, preserve, uh, make some really amazing, delicious uh, bird products through these traditional processes. I have a playlist over here where I do make chicken thighs, chicken meat. I cure it in different ways with different uh, of flavor profiles and all of that stuff. So you can check it out and um, get inspired, get recipes, step-by-step -step guides, everything you need so you can safely deliciously and holistically prepare, cure, smoke, bird meat without getting in trouble or even dying because that's the whole reality of it. That's why the industry uh, dumps the chickens in multiple chlorine baths. Okay, so uh, I have not done uh, lamb or, or um, goat because i don't eat lamb or goat is just a, a taste thing it's nothing religious or anything like that i just i don't like it uh, i have done rabbit so it can be done on rabbit i mean red meat i don't see any reasons why red meat would would be a problem 
uh, and with pork L listen uh, beef is great pork is great but beef can have E. coli and pork can have trichinella spiralis so the most important thing that you have to do whenever you're even contemplating considering making one of these salt cured meat recipes whatever you want to call it make sure that you source your meat from a respectable reliable reputable source yeah a butcher that has uh, uh, often controls from the health and safety officers somebody who has that you know again working in the food industry for so long uh, I would get visits from the health inspectors and food safety inspectors and if you passed if if you were compliant uh, you would get a badge that went on the on the door of the shop so people knew that you are compliant and your food is safe or you are not compliant and your food is not safe uh, so look for that when you go shopping for meat look at the doors i don't know maybe in your country that's not some something that happens but in most countries food and food safety and health and safety are taken very seriously and you will see those uh, sometimes inconspicuous badges or, or um, uh, stickers on the doors of businesses especially the ones that provide food and see if they're compliant or not and see when that badge was um, given to them because maybe they passed the the audit three years ago and they have the the good one over there but then here somewhere uh, where nobody can see it, they have the one that they just missed or didn't pass three months ago so source your meat from a very healthy and tested uh, source also i want to disrespect you or i don't know or put you on the spot but if you grow your own meat good for you i wish one day to do the same but test your meat just because you fed it in a holistic way just because you raised that animal on pasture regeneratively and all of that stuff when you process it make sure to send uh, samples to to the veterinarian to the veterinarian and make sure that uh, the meat is safe and is not contaminated make sure that uh, the butchering is done by somebody who knows how to do that because a lot of the cross contamination happens in the butchering process um, there's many many things that I don't want to make this video about 17 hours but in the comments of this video you guys add your questions about everything that we're talking today and we're gonna expand this conversation because hey <laughs> there's so much to know about food safety there's so much to know about health and safety there's so much to know about making sure that again to quote a very famous politician when you do put food on your family uh you're not gonna endanger them or yourself because if something happens to you and you're the, your family's provider uh, that leaves them in um in dire straits no doom and gloom yeah safety first uh, a hard hat uh so that's with, with any animal it's like grass-fed beef oh yes grass-fed beef let's charge people an arm and a leg for grass-fed beef but in case you didn't know E. coli doesn't just grow inside of the cow it comes from the grass it's a soil pathogen soil born pathogen so the grass eats uh, the the cow <laughs> the grass eats the cow the other way the cow eats the grass gets the bad juju inside of it and if you raise uh, a beef for yourself you sacrifice it and then you eat it and you get in trouble or you cure it and all of that stuff listen even when you cook meat that's contaminated that's not a sure thing that it's gonna make it safe to eat so i'll tell you this and i'll stop just so you were aware of um of some things about food and cooking and especially meat if you have a piece of contaminated meat regardless of what species of animal it is and that bacteria pathogen has been present in that piece of meat for a specific amount of time which is a bit longer than than 24 hours then that pathogen multiplies yeah and when you cook it especially if you do it well done whatever it may be chicken beef pork then you kill the live aspect of that bacteria so you kill the colony yeah technically good to eat but what you cannot kill is their poop because bacteria in order to grow multiply 
and uh, you know spread all over the the piece of meat it eats multiplies poops the more they are the more they eat the more they poop so that poop of theirs is a toxin it's called a toxin so you cook the meat you kill the bacteria but you cannot remove or um, or kill the toxin itself their poop you're just eating okay i'll stop <laughs> with the analogy you get the point yeah i'm not gonna go there so just because you cook the meat well done doesn't mean that it's safe to eat that's what i'm trying to say going to the second part of uh, of the question which is does the meat need to be stored in the fridge or can it just stay on the counter indefinitely i've, I've answered this question before but i'll just make a, a quick uh, add-on right now uh, to say that you can also vacuum seal the meat and this way you stop it from uh, rehydrating or dehydrating so then you keep it at the state or in the state that it was when you finished the process uh, basically so if you follow my DIY home cured meat recipe or process then you can just vacuum seal it and then it's gonna last again for uh, for a very long time if it's vacuum sealed because you just eliminate any type of uh, interference from the outside like I said bacteria or fungi or any mold spores and all of that stuff but just remember one thing when our ancestors started curing meat with salt or preserving meat with salt they kept the meat inside of the bags of salt or barrels of salt until they needed it that's why it lasted for uh, a humongous amount of time years yeah there's records saying that it would even last 10 years it would be a husk, it would become more like jerky after all of that time because basically you remove all the moisture. But um, I, I don't want you guys to forget that if you do want uh, this meat to, to last for a very, very long time because you're a prepper, because you just, I don't know, you found an amazing deal on meat or you found an amazing deal on, on uh, live hogs and you bought... 10 of them and you process them and now you have three metric tons of meat to, to process the way to do it is to just leave it inside of the meat for a very long time because that's going to preserve it that's going to keep it safe that's going to um, keep it from um, air exposure which again if there's fat on the on the piece of meat that you're curing with salt because of air exposure that fat is going to oxidate and basically become rancid that's the the natural uh, i wouldn't say rotting but that's the natural process because it doesn't rot being so high in, in salt the the ultimate answer to keeping this meat as long as possible as safe as possible is to leave it in the salt next question Next question comes from Gary Williams and the question is how do you store your finished meat uh, to prevent it from uh, further unintentional drying? I partially answered it before but what I want to add is that again you can vacuum seal it and that's going to basically stop it in time wherever it is right now and second of all if you do have a root cellar which they're like root cellars once you go on the ground they create their own microclimates uh, you're gonna have uh, a specific amount of moisture that is constant and you're gonna have a specific amount of temperature that is constant that's why in the past root cellars were the the ultimate technology for preserving and or, and keeping anything meat vegetables fruits uh, i remember my grandparents had a humongous uh, root cellar and they kept uh, fermented vegetables for winter like cabbage and, and green tomatoes like everything was kept there and including meats that they didn't want to become too dry like we love dried meats but some things like the the mussels like the pieces from the back anyway uh, they were kept in the root cellar because it was kept between 5 and 12 celsius and because the moisture uh, was at a level that was optimal for them not getting too moist and developing molds and um, you know those nasty colored molds like the black and the green and the blue uh, and not drying too much and a, a note on the molds when you do this meat curing process uh, or, or DIY home cured meats um, you will make mistakes 
and you will find yourself at some point with mold on your pieces of meat just remember this white and gray mold is good that's what makes you know the the fouets and the expensive salamis and all of that stuff and green blue and black are bad yeah you're gonna say well you know expensive cheeses have green mold yes but meat is not cheese two different types of protein so they don't go good together anything that's not white or gray molds has no place on your meat especially if you have black mold then you throw away that piece of meat burn it send it to mars something like that just don't even don't even um, think about cutting around it because molds fungi they don't work just on the surface somebody was uh, saying something well you can just wash it with vinegar yes you can wash it with vinegar if it's white or gray in order for i don't know if somebody doesn't like moldy stuff but they enjoy the, the the flavor that the mold brings to the piece of meat but if it's green blue any other color apart from white and gray then that's potentially highly toxic and you don't want to mess around with botulism and with stuff like that yeah okay let's look for another question when curing uh, the salted meat you say to store it in a dark dry cold place does the cold part refer to above freezing and the question uh, the answer is primarily yes especially in the beginning so for example if i am making a meat project let's say in november yeah and uh, the temperatures are going down but if i begin uh, let's say this um, traditional salt pork recipe um, when the temperature is above freezing and the meat has the opportunity to uh, absorb as much of the salt as possible because it's not a frozen block of like it's not a stone then uh, if it goes into minus if it goes into freezing time after that it's not a pro it's really not a problem uh, if it's already frozen uh, so imagine just taking a piece of meat out of the freezer and trying to cure it that doesn't really work if anything it's gonna it's just gonna stay there until the temperature drops uh, it's not gonna go bad because it's below freezing but it's not gonna do the curing process so the meat needs to be defrosted uh, in order for it to absorb the salt and in order for the salt to dry to to draw to draw the moisture out of it so yes the temperature needs to be uh, above freezing next question what cut of pork was used in this video in this specific step-by-step -step guide to curing meat with salt I used pork tenderloin but any piece of meat that it's lean can be used here like in the past I used pork loin pork ham anything that you have access to as long as as I mentioned in the past uh, is safe it comes from a safe source and it has the, the stamp you know that it's been tested that everything is okay next question after you cut into your product uh, how do you wrap it or store the remaining portion do you just hang it back up um, no because when you put a specific piece of meat in salt and start curing it uh, the outside is what creates the barrier you know the, the the stop sign for all of the stuff that wants to spoil it so when you cut in it you expose the sensitive or you expose the core of it which doesn't have that external protection uh, the, the way I keep it from you know going bad or if if I don't use it fast enough then I just vacuum seal it because again that just stops everything uh alternatively you can just let's say you have a piece of meat like this and you cut it in half yeah you take imagine that this is the half that's left you take this bit where the cut is and you stick it in salt that's another way to keep it from going bad but let's be honest when you open or you cut into a piece of meat because i doubt any of you are gonna just uh cure a big ham like some people do like those hamon ibericos and hamon serranos i doubt that you guys are going to do that and also this video is not for making prosciuttos and hamons it's just for curing pieces of meat with salt uh, i doubt that you're going to take a, a piece of meat like i had in the video that's like one kilo or half a kilo 
which is two pounds. Now half a kilo is one pound and a half, let's say. But I doubt that you're going to take it and just put it away. You're going to cook with it, right? Especially if you have a family, you're going to use all of that piece of meat and make a stew, make some rice and beans, whatever you, you're going to make with it. Um, but if you will not use it, then vacuum seal or put it in a piece of, in a, in a cup with salt and just, you know, dig it, I would say, two inches inside of the salt. Next question. I really enjoy the video. I plan on using it. I make almost everything because I cannot buy the stuff all the time. Well, that, that's the whole point of this channel. The whole point of this channel is to share with you the stuff that I learned from my elders and that I practice every day in my life to help you be as self-sufficient, self-reliant, food secure, food aware as possible. Because even if you cannot uh, grow your own food, like I, I, I couldn't do that for 32 years of my life. Now I have a small garden when I can do a lot of food growing. But even if you cannot do that, you can buy raw ingredients um, and cook at home, preserve stuff at home, make charcuterie products at home, cure meats at home. You can do all of these things on your own. And instead of buying something from the shop that's full of chemicals and preservative and MSG and emulsifiers and all of the gunk that they continuously try to feed us so that we get sicker, older, more decrepit as possible so they can take our money in the pharma district, you know, they feed us crap to get us sick and then they take our money when they sell us other chemicals to make us well so making your stuff at home is the best way possible cooking food at home is the best way to to stay healthy to know what goes inside of your food and to save money because i'm sorry if you buy a chicken let's say a whole chicken instead of buying parts which is one of their biggest gimmicks you know pay more for less if you buy a chicken from a chicken uh, you use the chicken thighs to make let's say a uh, uh, potato casserole or rice dish something that is going to feed your whole family because the meat all, all again the meat is an ingredient it's not the main attraction of any dish then you take uh, let's say the chicken breast and you make some uh, I don't know quesadillas or you make some empanadas or you make something where the chicken breast can just be again a filling protein filled ingredient then you take the back and the bones that are left and the claws and you make a big pot of broth that can be used after that to make soups to make uh, i don't know whatever add uh, three potatoes two carrots uh, uh, an onion and a handful of soup noodles and you have again another meal then you save those uh, <laughs> chicken wings uh, for a while until you get multiple chickens multiple weeks and then you when you have enough chicken wings stored you make a chicken barbecue or a, again something chicken wing something so this is what i mean you know you can stretch each ingredient so far that it's it's not even uh, present in our common understanding these days because this is what our forefathers did this is what my grandparents did that's that's how they never lacked anything because yes they grew a lot of their stuff but at the same time they didn't waste anything every in every part of the animal was used every part of the vegetable was used okay they didn't need the potato peels but they cooked the potato peels and they fed it to the hog that then fed them you know it's, it's a cycle so yeah learn how to cook at home learn how to make these things at home and you're going to be free from from the system yeah next question the question is is there a limit on either small or large size cuts i would say do what works best for you you know yourself you know your family you know your eating habits so if uh, i use this technique especially when i when i do bacons and cured bacons and all of that stuff by the way there's a playlist here where i have so many videos on bacon and other cured meats so just check it out and and get your inspiration get your ingredients and get your recipes on how you can be more self-sufficient and, and food reliant on yourself um, but the question is 
um, size. Does the size matter? Isn't that the question of all ages? And, and size matters because how big of a piece of meat are you going to use when you cook once? Because this is going to fix the problem from the previous question is what do you do when you cut into the piece of meat? You use some of it, but then you're left with one chunk. So I would say sit down, think about your eating habits, think about how much meat per recipe you, you, you normally use. Think about what cured meat would suit each recipe. And based on all of these things, I know, sitting down and actually thinking about all of these things in a world where everything is trying to steal our attention is, is torture. But you need to get serious about this. You need to get serious about the food that you put in your body in this temple that is what holds us every single day on this planet. So sit down, go through the process, decide, and based on your specific criteria based on your specific needs and your family's needs you're going to decide the size of that piece of meat it doesn't matter it can be as small as let's say the palm of my hand to as big as the container that you can cure it at, uh, cure it in uh, in a in a previous video I'll, I'll see if i still have cards available i'll put it there um, i show you how i built my own salt box and I used just pieces of, uh, of pallet wood that's not treated and not poisoned with all of those uh, chemicals that sometimes they put in specific pallets, uh, transport pallets, I mean, and just a handful of screws and two hinges that I had around. So I didn't really spend anything apart from the electricity to, you know, put everything together and to cut the, the planks. And I made myself a, a salt box that I'm going to use for years to come. So depending on the tools that you have, depending on the food habits uh, uh, that you and your family have, that's going to help you decide on the size of the meat. If anything, if you look at my videos, I'm very consistent with the sizes of meat that I am uh, presenting to you and that I am using in these cured meat videos because that's my, that's my standard. You know, when I cook, I need that piece of meat, which is usually half a kilo a pound a pound and a half so that's what i use next question okay so next question comes from coal crawlers um, i've seen many others salt the meat by rolling it and then rubbing the the salt into the meat until it's fully covered have you tried both methods if so what do you like better thank you for your time uh, so basically he's asking that should you just take a piece of meat and cover it in salt and rub it rub the salt in or just put the meat in the salt box cover it with salt forget about it for a couple of days and then come back and continue the process um, these are different curing methods uh, i do use both of them and i do have videos on both of them uh, i'll if i still have cards i'll put a video here where i've used the rubbing method um, that's more for curing the meat uh, with salt for the flavor. So it's the, the video that I've done uh, where you cure the meat in the fridge. You rub it with salt. The salt gives it the flavor. The salt helps with the fermentation process that goes into creating that charcuterie meat. And yes, meat ferments. And that's why you go to a deli shop and you buy a very expensive piece of meat that you pay an arm and a leg for like a hundred grams and it tastes amazing like I don't know let's say a uh, uh, copa or uh, prosciutto or something like that it's funky it's cheesy it's fermented so that's what just rubbing the meat and then covering either in collagen or in cheesecloth and hanging it for a specific amount of time usually until it loses 35% of its original weight. That's the safety. Well, wh why am I putting it in quotation marks? That's where the meat is safe to eat raw uncooked, when it has lost all of that moisture, 35% of the original weight. Uh, whereas putting a piece of meat in salt, cover it with a mountain of salt, and, and what this video is about that I'm uh, talking to you about, um, that's more for preserving and uh, 
and keeping resources for as long as possible instead of creating a delicious, uh, I don't know, soul enhancing melody in your, in your mouth, in your palate. I hope that answers the question. I, I don't want to continue and, and just uh, opening too much the topic because uh, this video is going to become seven hours long and this is not a podcast, though you can listen to it as a podcast as well. The next question comes from Don Mayer um, and it is, can you do it in a hot, humid city dwelling? And after it's done, can you store it as well? And does it have to hang forever? So that's three questions in one. Can you do it in a hot, humid city dwelling? I have done it in a hot, humid city dwelling. I was living in the center of London for a very big chunk of my life. And that's where I was doing it. Again, if you have a fridge or like a, a corner in your fridge where you can do it, then I have a video. It's like the most viewed video on my channel. That's what I did. Follow that video. Uh, if you don't have space in the fridge to do it, then use a cupboard. Use a cupboard and hang the meat uh, in the cupboard. Use the lowest cupboard that you have in your kitchen um, or make yourself, build yourself a curing box. Uh, I'll put a link in the description uh, where you can follow a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to make your own curing box just from a plastic container and some uh, wood dowels and a computer fan. So I've done that and it works fantastically. So yes, the answer is yes, you can do it either in the fridge, in a lower cupboard, or by building your own curing box uh, for not that much money. The next part of the question is, after it's done, how can I store it? I've already covered uh, a lot of storing methods, so just go back into the video on the timestamps and you're gonna find it. And the last part of the question, does it have to hang forever? The answer is no. Uh, if it hangs continuously, then it's going to continue to lose weight and it's going to become very dry and uh, maybe that's what you want. Maybe you want it to become very dry um, and ferment, continue fermenting and get like that <laughs> insane... Like, listen, I had meat that hanged for seven years, I think it was, and it looked like a husk. You looked at it and it, like you didn't think much of it. But when you had a slice of that meat, literally, you heard angels singing. It was that kind of an experience. So as long as you can control the temperature, as long as uh, you can control flies and all kind of like insects that will try to get there, uh, as long as you can control moisture so the molds don't grow on it. That, again, we spoke about the colors of the molds and everything. Uh, check the, the timestamps. As long as you can make sure that the meat won't spoil, I would say you can keep it indefinitely and then end up with like a magnificent end product that would make everybody jealous. Like I would be jealous. I would knock on your door and say, please, sir, can I have some more? Can I have some more? Give me some more. I would do that. Like for, for delicious cured meat, I'll ask for more. Okay, let's go. Almost done. Almost done. I'm lying. I'm just halfway through. I, I just cannot lie. But just don't worry because I know you're finding this content ultra, 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 mega, super duper useful. So I know you're not going anywhere, but also there's timestamps so you can come back to the video whenever you want and continue. But there's a lot of uh, positive messages. Actually, most of the comments that I get on all of my videos are positive. So thank you very much to all of you for being so open minded to self-sufficiency, to healthy food, to home cooking and to taking as good care of you and your family as possible, because that means that you respect yourself. That means that you, you consider yourself to be a valuable member of society, a valuable member of your family, a valuable member of your community. Um, in a world where we're bombarded constantly, that we're not worth anything, that we're not good enough, that we're the scourge of the universe and that uh, it would be better if we wouldn't exist, you know? So thank you very much for watching content like this and for giving me feedback. And I just want to say that 
the majority of, of feedback that I get, not the majority, all of the feedback that I get from you guys, that's not just, you know, positive praises, is constructive. And I learned so much from you. So please, I know this is a, <laughs> a question and answer video to a video that already exists, but questions never end. So if you have any questions that build on what we discussed in this video, please, I beg of you, put them in the comments. And in time, well, like, first of all, I'll answer your question straight away. But in time, if this video develops uh, a, a boatload of questions, I'll make a video on this video. And we're going to get into that rabbit hole of inception, you know, video about video about video about video about video. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter as long as you benefit from it, as you learn something from it, as you get something of value out of it that's going to make your life better, your family's life better, your budget's um, level growing because you know how to home cook, you know how to create these products for yourself and for your family and save a boatload of money because, again, next time, next video, we'll see how this one does. I don't want to go too much. I don't want to over deliver more than I've already done. Continuing. Uh, this is a very um, interesting comment. It's from Wash Burn Billy. It says, great video. I'm a little sketchy on doing this, but I might give it a go anyway. And, you know, it's normal to feel a bit scared. It's normal to feel a bit overwhelmed. It's normal to be, you know, on the ropes. If you should do, if you should work with raw meat, if you should eat cured raw meat, because, you know, this is demonized so much, as it should, I'm, I, I mean, I went through my own demonizing process when I spoke about, you know, safe meat, make sure that you get the safe meat and all that food safety, health and safety part. But uh, that shouldn't stop you from trying. Um, if you watch all of my videos, I have an extensive playlist on curing meat with salt, curing meat with smoke, curing meat in general and preserving meat, vegetables, canning. If you watch all of my videos, they're masterclass level uh, in information, quality. I'm not a, a videographer. I'm not a film person. Um, I'm semi comfortable to sit in front of the camera, as you can see. Uh, I'm not the most well-spoken person. English is not my uh, primary language, but you will get the information, masterclass information. Everything else is not masterclass, but the information comes from experience, comes from working in the food business for 15, going on 16 years. So I share with you everything. I don't put anything behind the paywall because my joy, my happiness, and my satisfaction is to see you guys doing it is to see you guys becoming self-sufficient and and self-reliant uh if i <laughs> if these things are going to be counted as good deeds then definitely i would like to go to heaven and i would like to go to heaven through this kind of good deeds uh, if any of you want to donate anything to me i'm not going to say no but i'm not going to put stuff behind patreons and and all of that stuff because what's the point well, gatekeeping uh, the most basic needs of us humans, I think that's uh, that's something, it's sketchy at best. I'm not saying it's wrong. Everybody can do whatever they want. I'm not going to sit and point fingers and judge. But I just want to give you all, give it to you all. And if that's going to create positivity in your, um, in your life, that's going to create positivity in your pocket, that's going to create positivity in, uh, in the um circle of your family then just leave me a comment uh, and that's it <laughs> tell me about it and that's it that's all i want from you um and that's all i want for myself as well i just want to help in the best way i can and if the universe god whatever you want to name you want to use it if i was put on this earth to to be a chef and to learn all of these things and now to share it with you and to like condense all of these years into a video format like this and this is my purpose then i am happy to do this honestly i am so happy and grateful to have the the opportunity to do this and um, okay now let's go back <laughs> to the questions 
So this is a useful comment for those of you living in the States, especially in Texas, because Jack the Giant Killer, what a great name, says that uh, the, Morton, the Morton Salt Mine in Grand Saline, Texas, sells bulk rock salt for $63 a ton, 2,000 pounds. Jesus! He continues, I personally believe that salt will become as valuable as gold as it once was in ancient times long ago. And I believe the same thing. Uh, let's not forget that um, in the Roman Empire, salt was one of, if not the most valuable commodities uh, that you can get. Soldiers were paid in salt. You get expressions like worth your salt or worth, worth his or her salt from that. Uh, the word salary comes from salt. Uh, all of this comes from salt and I agree with Jack the giant killer when saying that salt will become as valuable as gold. Um, I'm not saying start stocking um, or prepping and, and keeping uh, tons upon tons of salt but Jesus $33 for a ton of salt that's that's a steal. <laughs> Who has that storage space but still uh, salt is one of the most important commodities that we have these days as well. Going back to what I've said before, let's not forget that salt is essential to human function, to brain function, electrolytes, yeah, water and salt, electricity, electric activity in our body, mo moving your muscles, e everything comes through electricity. So yeah, make sure you have salt and make sure you have the good kind of salt. My opinion, rock salt. Your opinion is do some homework, do some research, and then you're going to decide what's good and what's not. But I use for myself and for my family rock salt. Next question. Somebody's asking about the recipe. Well, I, I always not. I, I try my best to put recipe uh, in written format in the description of the videos as well. So in case you find a video that doesn't have a written recipe, like ingredients, quantities and all of that stuff in the description, it's either because um, I forgot <laughs> or because there's a limit on the amount of characters, of letters that I can use in the description of the video. So that if there's more important information than just the recipe, which is always present in the video per se, then it's because of that. But for this specific one, the recipe is present in the description. Also, a lot of people say that they're going to try it. And every time somebody says that they're going to try the recipe, I always I'm, I'm there commenting, make sure to tell me how it was, how it went, like, oh, I want feedback, I want you guys to try it, I want you guys to succeed, I want you guys to have the best experience with this process, and the best experience doesn't always mean that the, the, the project is going to be successful, because we learn from mistakes, we learn from unexpected um, situations, um, and just because we follow a specific recipe that somebody gives us doesn't mean that we can uh, replicate exactly to the point their conditions. So this is something that I sometimes get. I don't get it as often as I thought I would where people say that, um, that this is a general, it's not specific to this video, where they say, well, I tried your recipe, but uh, dot, 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 something, I don't know. The result was different, not necessarily bad, but anyway. And this is because the conditions, you know, uh, the reason why I'm quite technical in, in the curing and in and, and the meat focused videos, let's put it this way. If I'm very technical in the meat focused videos is because health and safety, food safety is my main priority. Second, success and taste is my second priority. And third is uh, everything else, like easy to use, user friendly, all of that. Like I want you to get something that you can be proud of, something that you can enjoy, something that can be shared, because it doesn't matter if it's an easy to do recipe or easy process or cheap or whatever uh, thing you want to put there. If you don't end up with a safe to eat, enjoyable product, then you wasted your time. So I, I want to avoid that. That's why I always encourage you to make sure that you follow these recipes as well as you can and also to pay really good attention to the conditions can you replicate the conditions that I am sharing with you if not 
ask me how you can adjust it. I'm happy to answer these questions, you know, um, give me your um, conditions, give me your recipe, give me your possibilities, and then I can give you an advice, you know, and see how you can control it, adjust it, transform it to suit your environment. Okay, that's it. I just went through like 20 comments that were just uh, positive feedback. So uh, this is the end of this video. Again, thank you very much for being here with me. Thank you very much for giving this a chance. Thank you very much for having the desire and the drive to learn more, to become better. My um, main drive inside of me, the software that drives me every day to wake up and to continue until I go back to sleep is to provide. I want to provide for my family. I want to provide for anybody that is dependent on me. And also I want to provide for you all out there. So this video is about that. It's about providing outside of my family because for my family, I do everything in my, every cell, every mitochondria in my cell is just providing for my family. I want to extend this providing aspect to you all through these videos and giving you as much information as possible in a format where we can actually have uh, some kind of a conversation where I can give you everything and I'm not um, stopped or reduced or uh, limited by, I don't know, let's say a, a, a normal YouTube video where I need to stay in between specific parameters or YouTube is not going to show it to anybody. So it's not necessarily about being a waste of time and energy on my part. It's about you not getting the information and the benefit of, of this information and of my effort, of course. Whereas this is more of an open conversation. I can give you everything that I know about a specific uh, topic, uh, answer a question in the most depth way possible. You're going to get so much usefulness out of uh, using your time, out of sharing your time with me on these topics. As I mentioned before, this is a pilot, this is the first episode in this new series that I want to call All Them Questions. And if I see that you guys are interested and this video gets, I, I don't care about numbers. I just, I want to see that it doesn't just get abandoned or doesn't get any traction. If it does get some traction and interest, then I'm going to continue with other videos. And I would be interested in those of you out there, put it in the comments. What video would you like me to do next? Go into my playlists, whatever you want. I got, I think, 116-ish videos and go for it. Leave all your suggestions, all your comments, and I can, I can pick the next video from there. It doesn't matter which one. Just don't pick the, the most viewed one because I don't even know where to begin with that one. It has so many comments. It has so many questions that probably I would have to do like a 24-hour marathon uh, just to, just to scratch the surface of it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much again for your time. Uh, I wish you all the best. I hope, uh, all of your cooking culinary projects are going to become tasty and palatable and delicious. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye.